laptop around. Yes. Okay. Hopefully it will work. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this topic is basically about the uh, digital content, and uh, it's about the. Um, Exploring the um, uh, digital ecosystem and how it is heterogeneous in nature and how it is fragmented. So for this first, we have to uh, look what is the digital content. Digital content is basically um, there are two types of content in the digital content. One is the creative content, which has some cultural entertainment values and link to the uh, their uniqueness. This could be the uh, movies, uh, 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 soundtracks, or uh, anything like uh, related to entertainment. And the process information is information according to the timely adaptation or the user preference. It is uh, the process. Which is, it is basically process information that is uh, uh, according to the user requirements and uh, uh, adaptation. And uh, the difference between both them is the uh, creativeness. But they are not well defined boundaries between them, and the mobile content is basically uh, made up of both creative content and processed information. And this uh, uh, content is basically um, uh, uh, classified into nine different uh, types. Well, uh, these are the nine types: mobile television and video, mobile music, including the ringtones, back tones, full tracks, and uh, mobile gaming, mobile adult, in, including the images and videos. Mobile personalization, including wallpapers and images, mobile user-generated content, mobile publishing, including the books and magazines, mobile advertisements, and mobile gambling. These are the classification of all the digital content. And uh, uh, this classification is extensively used in the markets for analysis and the forecast for the research areas and very useful to explain the different terminologies in mobile content. But according to uh, this paper, this has very limited validity and usefulness. We are, uh, what, uh, what are the reasons? Uh, are the, those are the reasons that are suggested are that uh, the advertisements are also considered as uh, the part of content. But the advertisement parts hides the intensive mobile content and activities. And there are also reasons like the different people activities are sharing same headings. Like the music includes the ringtones as well as full tracks. Um, uh, as both are uh, for different purposes. Ringtones are for different purposes and the full tracks are different purposes, but they are sharing the same heading. In the television program broadcasting is different as compared to the on-demand videos like YouTube. So uh, just because of these, uh, some uh, uh, dis uh, sharing of the headings, there are some dispute that these are uh, these uh, is the classification is not valid. Nice. All right. Okay. Uh, this is was all about the digital content, but if we uh, at the mobile dimension in the digital content, uh, then we have to uh, uh, reclassify and uh, categorize again the digital content. So there are four ways of categorizing uh, the digital content. If we add the mobility um, mobility feature into the into it. First is adapted. It is the uh, type of the content which uh, do not need any uh, modification, and it is as is it adopted by the mobile uh, platforms. And the uh, other is the original that is purely created for the mobile platforms and uh, mobiles, and uh, augmented the art that needs transformation from the mobile environment, and the repurposed are the that can be you you reused and adaptive to the mobility. This could be the like uh, the games and the uh, uh, Soundtracks present in the saved in the mobile and can be reused and uh, it's according to its uh, mobility, adopted to its uh, mobility nature. So the, here we can see some examples of uh, these, uh, uh, like uh, the, the uh, content specific, um, mobile specific uh, content is uh, like the. New mobile music and gaming, which are only for the uh, specific for the uh, mobiles, and uh, also like the mobile search and mobile social networking, 
which are specifically uh, uh, designed uh, uh, written for the mobiles and this is also augmented because uh, this is somehow transformed for the mobile content and um, here for repurposed includes in mobile TV, mobile music, mobile entertainment which can be reused and uh, according to the uh, nature of mobile, mobility nature of uh, the content and then mobile content adapted which includes the mobile news, web search adapted to mobile, mobile mails which don't which don't need any uh, additions it, it is as yeah, it is um, uh, adaptable for mobile and mobile augmented includes the location content location aware content fragmentation um, the uh, the whole uh, uh, categorization and classification was showing the heterogeneity and, uh, and the heterogeneous nature of uh, the uh, digital content or um, this is can also be uh, viewed as in the form of the fragmentation which is uh, done basically by dividing the uh, mobile content into three uh, different market uh, segments but basically what is fragmentation fragmentation is the sense of different approaches needed to cater for user demands um, it, it causes the market segment into the distinct strategies so um, I can explain with it more with the diagram these are the three uh, strategies or you can say the segments which are uh, 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 which are for the mobile content first is the creation or production second is the delivery and distribution access and the third is the use consumption and interaction and it is applicable for all the kind of content like creative content new content information uh, in the creative content when its creation includes the audio visual music video uh, video publishing but uh, when it, we came to its delivery then it's uh, and its distribution it's uh, on the radio and the television broadcasting and uh, how the user use it or how it is consumed it is through the electronic devices suppliers and same is the, for the new content not same the mobile it is uh, new content is according to the mobile location or application or the it could be the rights management or could be the online payments or, could, or anything like uh, that is creating the new content and it is all, uh, it is distributed through the mobile or wireless uh, communication and it is used by the uh, some uh, industries like transport and domestic um, and uh, if we can say about the information it is uh, it includes uh, media culture spaces culture spaces layer spaces position where it could be the um, location where uh, information in which it could include uh, the museum or libraries or the tour sites or any information that could be uh, distributed through internet and used to, with the help of some software software suppliers like to uh, to use those information it could be multimedia player or something like this so this is basically fragmentation of the digital and uh, this is the um, uh, second step of uh, yeah, mobile phone content delivery topology how uh, the content is delivered according to uh, the, this paper it, uh, the television and radio broadcasting is follow uh, radio um, radio spectrum yes radio spectrum and uh, these are uh, the uh, and uh, I cannot read it uh, clearly uh, in, uh, even in the paper but it was uh, um, mentioned that these are about uh, like uh, the, these are broadcasting ways that uh, then then that are then the, there is a network which includes the 2G, 2G, 3G, and other, and then uh, these are the web SMS. Then these are how these are delivered, and uh, uh, it could be the web SMS, web or flash, Java, and then it's come to browser, and then it is your uh, data that could be the text messaging, text images, audio, video games, and this is done on the <coughs> part is done on the PC how it is uh, delivered uh, to the uh, PC or your tablet or your phone you, you know, the third is how it is used uh, and consumption is an interaction the consumption of uh, uh, the content is basically is done in the first uh, four stages uh, first is the when the content is uh, 
retrieved. It could be the adoptive repurpose original as I have described uh, before. And then after getting the content, the, the next step is to appropriately inserting mobile advertisements. Then personalization of the content and advertisement and advertisements. And then fourth one is to, to check the uh, the content uh, and the check it is according to specification of uh, the uh, device or not. For example, it's a hardware and display and interface. Is it, it is compatible or not? It's an approach system again compatibility and the relevant applications if, if there are browsers and media players and technology used in the networks like uh, wireless digital television and um, it also depends on the implementation of uh, operator system like web sms and premium sms this mobile content is our now uh, uh, being used for as the business to make the business uh, make business and um, uh, there are some models for the, um, the mobile content business models which are discussed in this uh, uh, paper and these all are the models the first model is subscription that is uh, that as uh, that um, have some periodic uh, con digital content and uh, it has uh, periodic uh, uh, charges. It could be the daily, uh, weekly, and really monthly, or like this. And the other is the paper use or utility model. In this, uh, in this uh, model, the provider are actually measuring the usage, how uh, how much they are using. Uh, you are using the content, and they are uh, charging you according to uh, uh, your usage, unlike the sus subscription. Advertisement, advertising is just advertising and that is uh, mostly used by the um, um, telephone companies, the service providers. The, the brokerage or market uh, makers are that are uh, those who charges a fee for after each transaction. Informatory are the basically who uh, assist the buyer and seller to understand and use the market. Uh, they are basically uh, more in uh, market and uh, they they basically uh, do the market campaigns and uh, they uh, take the charges uh, they charge uh, they take the charges for their services and the merchants are the retailers of mobile content goods and service like uh, they are selling the mobile content and goods and direct to customer uh, this uh, producer of the content reach directly to the customer so there is no uh, third party in between and the affiliation is the purchase point click uh, click through to the merchant exchange. Um, uh, like pay, uh, pay per click, it is very common on nowadays on the uh, websites uh, on the internet that uh, it's a kind of advertisement that uh, um, every time uh, on each click you are get paid. And the, the last one is the community, it's a voluntarily contribution. If someone is providing some facilities or some services and do not asking for any uh, charges and community voluntarily con uh, community gives its voluntary con contributions, then it is an example. The main players of mobile content business models. There are four basically uh, players in this uh, business. Uh, in related to mobile content, first are the mobile operators that are providing the uh, mobile uh, uh, service, the telephone service. Um, they, they charge you for uh, every kind of sharing the content it, and they also charge for using the internet. And the second is the content provider. The content provider are, could be the companies or the uh, parties who have agreements with the uh, mobile operators. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, they, they they charge for the they have different agreements for the um, uh, SMS and their like uh, ringtones like wallpapers and different uh, agreements for the videos and music files and third one is uh, the device supplier like uh, Nokia and Apple uh, they are uh, also uh, using the uh, mobile content as their and uh, business. And an application provider like the Google, like uh, Android, and uh, they, these four also have the same uh, common interest 
that is the profit and they are uh, working on it and to create the new business models uh, uh, to um, have more profit oh, okay and then the conclusion part what uh, uh, they are trying to suggest that using the uh, this feature of uh, creativity and mobility the mobile um, uh, the techno uh, they could be developed at techno economic uh, systems that are uh, less common with others so that uh, mm, the, uh, the dimension uh, the content in the uh, dimension that is not interested could be vanished like um, yes all right thank you very much So, any questions so far? So, what what do you think is different between the normal content providers and mobile content providers? What are the kind of the main differentiating characteristics? Um, no, sorry, can you repeat? What differentiate content providers in the normal media space compared to the mobile space? What is specific to mobile? Um, For the content providers. Content providers are basically um, could be the companies that are uh, providing them the ringtones, the companies, uh, the content, uh, the service providers, mm -hmm. the wallpapers, the ringtones, or this other uh, things uh, to the uh, service providers, so that uh, so they have agreements and they have some um, charges for this, and they are also making money indirectly from this uh, mobile content. Right, so one, one aspect is there is c part of the content which is specific to mobile, like yes. ringtone, yeah. you know, you wouldn't upload the ringtone to your PC, right, yeah. to your laptop, it's specific to the mobile, mobile space. What else? What else is sort of specific to mobile from the content point of view? This, um, the, in this paper, we were discussing about the games, mobile, uh, full tracks, movies, videos, and uh, the things like this, the images. Right. So, so some some things are kind of shared. Yeah. Um, so let's go. Yeah. So some of these. Uh, most of these are. Yeah. So some some of these mm -hmm. are specific to mobile. Um, some of the gaming is specific to mobile as well. You you can't have those those things in general. Um, so why mobile gambling is a gray area? Because it is not uh, um, decided that if it is allowed to, to do online gambling through mobile. Mm -hmm. There are many companies and uh, they are providing the online gambling facilities. Already, that's right. Yeah. And so, so that's why it was a statute to agree into. So How does that work, though? Uh, you have one online gambling version. Yeah. They are allowed. Yes. Uh, so you can just access that website through the browser. Yeah. But can you have an app, which is a gambling app? Yeah. Well, uh, it, it's more legit than some of the uh, other websites. <laughs> <laughs> it's supposed to be one gambling. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Right. So what? Um, yeah. So you've added that. Right. So. There is a little bit here about the personalization, right? So the mobile device is a very personal device. So a laptop is a laptop, and if you're you know, distributing a movie to be screened on laptops, you usually don't know who is on the other side. If you're distributing a movie through a mobile content provider or network, you know exactly who is watching that movie, right? Um, same with advertisements and same with everything else. So it is a little bit more personalized than any other media. They, they, that is changing. So TVs are getting smart. 
the TVs are kind of trying to collect data about who is using them. Uh, you can register, for example, on a Skype account over your TV. So then the TV will know who is using the TV because they can track who that person is and so on, right, to some extent. You can do web browsing. So again, the TV can sort of uh, track your web browsing habits and learn a little bit about you. So even TVs are trying to, to do that. But mobile is really intimate. Mobile is a very intimate device, and it knows quite a lot about you. So some of those things are kind of specific to mobile, the way the, um, the content is prepared. So if you are building an app, if you're building a system, where you have some form of a content delivery or con content creation, how much you should be taking into account the fact that it is a mobile platform and how much it's sort of uh, universally done regardless of the content delivery uh, mechanisms. What do you think? You mean how much uh, you should optimize the content that you distribute? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think if uh, you optimize as much as possible just for the fact that uh, nowadays uh, users of mobile uh, or mobile platforms they are quite uh, used to uh, having the, the best thing, so the, the most convenient one. Well, that's why we have apps instead of web pages, for example. Exactly. They are, they are more convenient to use than web pages and so on. So. If, uh, if we uh, target laptops and just uh, regular yes, computers, uh, it's not so important uh, what would be the uh, resolution of the screen that this, this, uh, this content will be watched on. Mm. Uh, so when it comes mobile, it's now much more important. And, and uh, since there is, uh, I think, uh, now there's too much. Um, I gave this word actually. <laughs> so, uh, too much information to consume uh, for users than the right users. So, mm. it's very easy to switch to something else if you don't like it. So, from just purely technical point of view, you can imagine how nightmare it is to be able to cater for all the variety of, of devices which is there. Right? If you have to stream a video, then you you have to take into account the speeds of the operators, uh, the size of the device, the size of the screen, the resolution of the screen, uh, the capacity of the device to do decoding, so the way you're kind of doing the streaming. Uh, and all the devices on the market is like, you know, thousands of those. So it gets kind of really complicated to, to do that. Uh, so how, how they do this and whether they do it well. So the companies, the, the big content delivery networks, they do that. Um, and they have specialized IT systems which keep track of all the parameters of the connectivity and all the parameters of the devices and so on. So the network operators, the, the telcos, they used to do that. They, their business was about keeping track of what device you're using, how it is configured, and they had kind of a big IT systems for knowing how to configure those, configure those devices. So if there was an update they can have to push to their customers, they knew exactly which device, what model, and what firmware you were running so they can do certain things in an automated fashion. Uh, but it is kind of logistically quite a challenging, quite a challenging thing. Um, so that, that's one aspect. The other one was monetization. So uh, how much this is different to, say, websites, if you have a web service? I'm the same. Sorry? I'm the same. It's all the same, right? Mm -hmm. It's exactly the same business models which work for the web service and for the mobile. So what are the differences? So if you have a periodic fee, um, so, so yeah, let's say you do have an app which people use, or you have a web service which people use. Is it a different way of using that service? 
Um, so yeah, let's say it is a little bit biased example, but let's say you sign up for the uh, Adobe drawing packages. They have online shop, and Microsoft is doing similar thing. So they have an online shop. You you sign up, and then you have an access to uh, some of the drawing uh, tools, right? So you use them, and then you have a, a, you know a, an app on the phone which you use for drawing with your finger. So it's on on a tablet. Um, so then, is it different? What what is qualitatively different between these two things to justify a different business model? Or is there nothing that different? It's a little bit different from technical standpoint. Because uh, 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 web page you access it in the browser. Yeah. And uh, when your subscription uh, well now your time signs up. So it's denied uh, uh, the access to that web service. Mm -hmm. And an app that is installed on your uh, phone, for example. So it, it's kind of um, maybe perception is different. So uh, you have an application, but it stops working at some point of time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but other than that, I don't think there is much. And what's a little different uh, on mobiles with this one is that uh, it's a little bit easier to pay with your phone because it uh, gives more information about your uh, payment uh, with cards and some other payment accounts. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so when using the computer and browser, you usually have to uh, enter some password anyway and stuff like that. Uh, mobile, if you need to, for example, tie your um, Google account to your Google Watch, mm -hmm. then uh, I don't quite remember, but you probably don't need to have that kind of thing. No, it's just like two clicks away from you making a purchase. Yeah. So, one of the, that, that is a very good point. So, one of the um, differences is that if, for example, I want to charge a user a fee, over my uh, web-based application. The user will have to enter some form of payment un unless I keep the credit card on record, which usually people don't want to. Right? So if they played for 15 minutes, and then they came to, uh, to a, a different content which I can sell them, and I ask them again to, to put the, OK, you can buy this now, right? but it will take you two minutes to fill up all those forms and stuff. And then they bought it, and then they carry on with a game or of some sort. And then I ask them, oh, by the way, you can now buy that one as well. <laughs> like, that would be really annoying, right? So one time fee is probably all you can ask for if you have an online system. So they pay once, and that's it. You could have a subscription fee. So you say, I want to buy this uh, for a year. And then they pay. And then in a year, you kind of remind them that they have to renew their subscription, and they have to pay it again. But it's not that trivial to make kind of a micro transactions with them. Whereas on mobile, you know, they reach a certain stage and they say, oh, yeah, you can upgrade this for, you know, 99 cents. Click here. And one click, and then the confirmation, and you, you're done. Uh, and both Apple and Google have made it extremely lightweight. Uh, it is going to, to the web as well. So Google Wallet is, you, you can do payments through Google Wallet. Um, no. That is exactly. There is a reason for this, though. So it is a very lucrative uh, model for the for the app developers and for the content delivery people too. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
from where he talks about how to exploit the whales or whatever he calls them, like how to get them to spend ten thousand dollars a month on the Yeah. In effort to That's right. Which is basically all about this how do you get people like is there enough to be able to spend that amount of money each month That's right. Yeah. It's it is kind of a moral way it, it is a borderline of immoral and unethical uh, practice. Uh, because uh, it taps into kind of a basic nature of, of human beings to, to like collect things and uh, once you've invested sufficient amount of time and into something you kind of can't really quit so it's similar with the pony, uh, pony example uh, so yeah I, I think it will have to be regulated at some, at some point because it is like gambling, it borderlines gambling um, but definitely that is something which the mobile space changed. The mobile space, because it was such cumbersome to enter your credit card, they very early on decided we need something better than that. Uh, whereas on the web, we've been putting up with entering credit cards for years before they decided, okay, that's, you know, that's a nuisance, we should change that. So PayPal and, um, and Google Wallet, they are kind of one-click shops where you can uh, purchase things with your account if you're authenticated. But on the mobile, you are authenticated all the time, so it's like even easier. Uh, but apart from that, the, the, there is not much of a difference between the, the mobile content business models, mobile business models in general, and the other uh, types of, of, um, of systems. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine possible ways, right? of monetizing on your apps. So when you're developing an app and you or a service and you're thinking of monetizing on it, you pretty much have one of those nine ways. There is no other way uh, you can do that. So you will fall into one of those categories. Uh, all right, any other comments about the content? How about the user-generated content? What do you think um, it has to offer? Do you necessarily have to pull it from one of them? Sorry? Do you necessarily have to pull it from one of them? I feel like there's a lot of people from advertisements all over the place. Cost money. But if you also pay us, you don't have to see these. Anymore. That's right, yeah. That is true. Yeah, you can creatively combine some of these, yeah. So you're kind of purchasing a, a feature which was originally there to monetize it the other way, yeah. So how about user-generated content? What do you think? I mean, YouTube was the, probably the first really big thing which uh, people thought it's, originally people thought it's not going to, why? If, if, when you when when was the first time you heard about YouTube before YouTube was famous? Do you remember those times? <laughs> and what did you think about this? Well, it was on the brink between that and one point zero and like two point zero. Yeah. At that time, nobody understood what two point zero was like. Yeah. Uh, but YouTube was like the, the most uh, prominent example. Mm. But I don't know, by the time I've heard about it, it was actually already quite popular. Quite big, yeah. So when I first heard about it, it was not big at all. And I thought, yeah, it's kind of a cool idea, but probably, you know, I never expected it to be that big, uh, to become that popular and that widely used. And I didn't know how Google was going to monetize it when Google decided to buy it. So, when YouTube started, it wasn't part of Google. It was just a own service. Yeah. And they kept it until some extent, I guess. I remember like, when I first heard about YouTube, and I don't know how to see it in like, other sites. Mm. Yeah, so that was kind of a very interesting phenomenon. And I think. 
with mobile, it is quite important too to, to take into account the fact that users can take contextual photography, can generate contextual comments and context, you know, contextual content uh, with being on the spot, being participating in the events and so on. Uh, and you know, it's a little bit different value of people blogging, like you know, on web WordPress. Uh, where you're sitting at home and, and blog about something, and people actually generating content being right there in the event uh, with the possibility of, of uploading video or, or um, um, photos. So, that's right, yeah. I think most of the time people underestimate like the power of uh, user created content and because it's a uh, limited uh, uh, a limited amount of uh, things that, that you have sometimes it's not really quite valuable but yeah uh, uh, when it's valuable it has a, a lot to it has a lot of value yeah, yeah that is true so th that is true that, that there is a problem of filtering and the long tail. So a lot of content is just crap below the kind of uh, quality or interest level at all, right? But there is this big spike uh, early on, on on the curve where there is some content which is user generated which has a lot of value, especially if, if the event if you are participated in that event. Uh, so it's almost as it, it, it's probably kind of the the best uh, journalism you can get. Kind of in real time, uh, sometimes. Yeah, because you mentioned like YouTube, uh, social media, and mobile phones, uh, everyone thought like it was wasn't going to be a thing, mm. and in the end, it turns out to be a, to be a really important, thing. really big thing. Yeah. All right. So let's um, let's continue. So who is the, the third presenter? Yeah. Do you have a presentation as well, or no, you... just the paper. Just the paper? Yeah. Okay. So let's carry on. I will unhook the the screen. And I will put your slides on onto the lecture material as well, if that's okay. Um, all right. So I will present a, a survey of mobile phone uh, sensing, which is extracted from the IEEE communication magazine from September 2010. So um, the, um, this paper discusses mainly about uh, the em emerging technology in software and hardware of uh, mobile uh, sensing. Um, uh, they discuss also uh, about, uh, they, they propose an architecture from, uh, for the, the framework and um, the emerging issues and technology that could um, that could carry on this uh, the, this problem, and um, so as as you know, um, in most of the mobile phone, we've got um, a bunch of uh, sensors like uh, the ambient light, proximity, dual cameras, GPS, accelerometer, microphone or compass or gyroscope. Um, in the first way, it was only here to uh, enhance the um, user interface of, um, of, of everyone, like the rotation of the screen. Um, when you put your telephone in your ear, the, um, the, the display is locked to avoid the problem of pushing some button, to, uh, to avoid some battery uh, consumption. Um, there is also the global position system to uh, to track where you are in the, in the space. So this is a, an important thing, and um, it's only recently with um, some uh, researchers uh, find another way to use the, the sensor to um, to upgrade the the, the, um, the the global experience and identify some uh, some behavior in. Um, in the, the human uh, compartment. So, so we find a re really a bunch of applications in different um, in different era, 
like uh, transportation. By using the, the global position system, we could identify the, the traffic jam in the, in the city. Um, in uh, healthcare, we could also, uh, like, uh, like the application uh, that does uh, Nike Plus, we could identify uh, how, how far you run in uh, which kind of time, and uh, we could extract some uh, um, the, 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 the information of how uh, uh, about the, the health uh, about the health of the um, of the person. Um, we could also make some um, some some observation about the the, the social behavior of uh, everyone. Um, so there are some interesting projects uh, like the Dartmouth uh, Sense, uh, Sense Me project, which investigate in the, the, the human behavior, and they try to replace uh, ma uh, the manual action of people with um, with automatically uh, uh, automatically action. Um, So then they, they propose um, a behavior for, for, for the application. So the, the, the behavior of, um, of an application should be, as according to the paper, uh, divided in three steps. The, fir the first step should be the sense, then learning, and then uh, inform and share um, the, the, uh, the, the result of the experiment. So for the, the sense part, they, um, they estimate that there's two, uh, two main things to identify for your application is the, the scale of, uh, of uh, the, the person you want to apply the, this, uh, this, uh, this experiment. So the, they identify three types of scale. So the first one is the personal sensing, where the experiment only apply to one person. Uh, the group sensing, which is uh, more more or less the same principle of a social network, where the, the people are connected between uh, themselves, and you could uh, and you extract some of the, the, uh, those information from this group, or the bigger one, which is the, the community community sensing, which uh, which there is no particular link between the person, and uh, you gather your data uh, directly from uh, the sensing uh, process. So about the sensing process, they propose two types of sensing uh, process, which is the, the participatory uh, sensing, where the, the user directly influences the experiment. They, they choose when, how, and uh, what to share with the, the, the application. So the, the result of the, the data you get from this experiment is only related to the person. So maybe it should not be uh, that good uh, as expected because the, the, the user could uh, influence the experiment, try to get the best result uh, he, uh, he wants for this experiment. So th this could be influenced, the, the, the result of this uh, experiment. Uh, and the, um, the other one is the opportunistic, the opportunistic uh, sensing, which is completely automatic. And uh, you only have to get uh, the, the result from your, your sensor you are using for this experiment. So maybe it's slightly better, but they, uh, they, they say that there is some problem, like um, microphone, when you, it's maybe not well suited for some experiment, like uh, if you you take a sample of sound in uh, an office and in uh, a noisy cafe, uh, you maybe not have some good uh, result for this uh, for this experiment. So they propose to make um, a hybrid one where the user influence the the experiment and uh, you take automatic uh, data for the the, the opportunistic uh, sensing. So for the learning process, so we've got several uh, issues in this um, in this step. The, the first one is mainly the computational uh, power of your device. Uh, when you want to, um, to, perform, to perform some uh, machine learning algorithm to, uh, to your data, so um, 
this is the main, uh, the main issues. Um, another issue is when your, your mobile phone is, uh, is really loaded by some app, uh, some app and those kind of stuff, you could get some problem by something because the, 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 the CPU of your mobile phone is uh, really loaded by uh, some other app and uh, you, could, you could not sample in a continuous way, which is uh, the, the most logical way for, for developers to implement uh, some sensing uh, application. So this is one of the issues. Um, the other issues is how you want to, um, to, make, uh, to make some treatment of those uh, data. How, how you, you want to, uh, if you want to, um, to use those data locally in your mobile phone, so use machine learning stuff in your mobile phone. So here you've got, no, uh, you've got only the problem of the power of your, mach your device. Um, you could also send those data to uh, the uh, cloud, uh, cloud server and uh, perform some uh, your, your machine learning uh, stuff without some requirement in the power. So, so much uh, requirement in the power. But about the privacy of your data, this could lead to some, uh, to some uh, problem in the in the in this uh, in, in this way uh, of uh, making uh, your experiments. And um, the ne the next step of your experiment should be to inform and share the um, and share and make some persuasion of uh, to uh, the user of uh, what, what he, he has given as data. Um, like, um, uh, like uh, for, so it's mainly the design you want to do from your, from the result of your, of your application, like uh, giving some, uh, some result uh, like Night Plus does in the web, uh, web browser. Um, given directly from your phone in an app, uh, it, it depends on the, des the design of your, your application. So at the end, about the architecture of your um, mobile app for, for sensing uh, purpose, you don't have really a clear, um, a clear explanation of how you, you have to design it. It depends really on the context you want to apply your your um, your application. It will not be the same thing for one person to uh, a, a huge community of uh, of person. So th there is no clear clear thing about that. Um, then they talk about some. Um, some uh, emerging uh, sensing manner. Uh, um, um, what they, they, they propose, some researcher propose something to, to make continuous sensing of uh, of, uh, of of what you, uh, you you are doing in different kind of uh, experiments. Um, at these steps, there is nothing really done because this is uh, really costly in terms of uh, battery of battery because uh, it uh, it uses uh, because it uses a lot of battery to, uh, to to give some alimentation of the of the sensor um, there is also some problem about uh, about the the way you use your your mobile because if you want to use the the, the mobile uh, the the sensor of your your mobile in one application, you cannot use the the the, the same sensor in the, at the same moment in another application. So th there is some multitasking problem about uh, about that, and uh, this is, this is mainly the, the problem and the other problem. Was the um, also, or also the, the, the machine learning uh, algorithm, which were the um, 
the main limitation because the, those, those algorithms are using a lot of power to to this mobile uh, platform. So why why is uh, machine learning important for the sensing applications? To to make some uh, some design of the the, be the behavior of your, the the user. Um, I, I don't I don't know um, if you if you do uh, only uh, one local uh, experiment to one person. This will not be uh, representative of the, the general behavior of uh, one person. Maybe if you want to to perform um, the a model of uh, the general way you you uh, you you take to uh, for the traffic jam, for example, mm -hmm. um, it's always better to to take several examples, several samples of your of your represent of your representative. And um, then try to uh, to learn a general behavior from the, those uh, those data, and to perform a, a model to um, to see if there is something uh, to to learn from that, and uh, to uh, try to maybe avoid uh, those problems of uh, traffic jam or make something uh, different. So in the context of traffic jam. We could upload stuff to the server and do the aggregated computing on the cloud on the server, right? Yeah. So we don't have to run machine learning on the phone. We Not could do that in the cloud. So when yeah. when we do have to run stuff on the phone, and why? What do you think? I I, I think it's mainly uh, if you if you take another example about the. The, the Nike uh, the Nike Chris purpose about your your fitness stuff. Yeah. Maybe you don't want to to share this with uh, with uh, other person. So this is better to 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 learn something directly on your mobile phone without sharing your your personal data with uh, other people. Yeah. So that's so. one one aspect. What is also related to this one, and uh, which is another one. What else do you think matters? So sometimes the act of, of sensing something depends on who is using it, right? So for example, we developed an app which counts your steps, but each person moves differently, and each person accelerometer data looks differently. Yeah. So to accurately count steps using the accelerometer data or accelerometer and gyro data, we have to modify the algorithm to suit you, your yeah. pers particular style of working. And we can't even count your steps if we don't do that. And then the learning has to happen on yeah. the mobile phone. So the mobile phone will sample you and then sample you again and learn how you're walking and how to count your steps to count the steps, yeah. right? And this has to be done on the phone because it doesn't make sense to be doing it in the cloud. Uh, and it has to be done sort of in real time as you're walking to adjust all the weights and yeah. to adjust the, the parameters and so on. And the same for other sens sensory mechanisms which relate to your your body or to your to you. So with the Nike Plus, that's kind of the case as well. Um, so they have to learn how you are using it and how you kind of uh, um, your body reacts to certain transitions. And I mean, how the phone reacts to your body transitions, how how your phone reacts to your steps and to your running and, and so on. So. For those purposes, we usually 
have to implement some form of machine learning on the phone to kind of fine tune the, the parameters. So in the mobile project, uh, there is a group, there are a couple of groups who do, who do sort of running apps, some fitness apps. Uh, and they track people, uh, you know, um, workouts. Uh, and one of the groups is doing step counting. And they ask how to do that. And I told them, yeah, you can use the accelerometer to do that. But, you know, they have three people in the group. And each person in the group works differently. So the same algorithm counts different amount of steps for each of those three people, right? They would have to have three different algorithms for three different people to properly count the steps. Uh, they will have, again, they will have consistent error, right? So if you not care about the actual number of steps, you just care, I walked double to what I walked yesterday, that algorithm probably will work relatively OK. Uh, but if you want to know relatively how much I'm working compared to you, that algorithm will not work because they, it makes different mistakes for me and different mistakes for the other person. Uh, so they, that's too much for them to actually make a machine learning algorithm which adjusts that on the fly. Yeah. Uh, they just have a manual kind of a setup where they choose different sens sensitivity settings for different people and they can adjust it themselves. But it's still very inaccurate. Uh, so with a, even a simple thing like step counting, that's already known trivial. Mm -hmm. So some of the systems, like the Fitbit or some other systems, they don't learn. They just mm -hmm. make a yeah. They just mix. yeah. Mm -hmm. They count and they make mis mistake and they are kind of inaccurate and they don't learn. Uh, but for some of the sensing thing which you talked about, yes. it is important to relatively count relatively. A, a you know, uh, correct values for certain things. Uh, yeah, one of the sense me, was it sense me? Or what was the dark, dark uh, uh, About yeah, yeah. the network. Yeah. So they, they used um, they used a microphone to to yeah. detect some of the activities you're doing, and that was quite an interesting um, that was quite an interesting um, take on, on, on the matter. Um, no, that's just noise. Yeah, you don't want to do that. But you can log it for yourself and then have some meta analysis on the data done on a daily or weekly basis to tell you a little bit more of what you've been doing, right? Uh, whether you've been sitting too much or you know. Yeah, uh, noise. Yeah. Yeah, how much time you spend socializing and, yeah. You've had one conversation so far. Probably you're depressed, yeah. You're avoiding people. Maybe to that thing because I need social activity as well. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, it is, it is a problem. We had a project with the uh, fall detection. No. Was it? We no 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 that wasn't a fault detection. That was a project with the Parkinson disease. I told you that uh, before, I guess, where we did the implementation on the phone and it took like 20 minutes for the phone to learn the classification, and then on the workstation on the laptop it was taking like 30 seconds. So it was mostly the memory limitation. Like you could hold the whole data set in memory and do quickly calculations on it. Whereas on the phone, it was garbage collecting the data continuously and reading it from the storage and so on. So it was taking much longer. Uh, and obviously, the CPU is slower as well. Um, so there, there are definitely some limitations. But the sensing space is kind of uh, expanding. And there, there is more and more sensors built in into phones. And we have some of the battery limitations lifted with the hardware support. Uh, and there will be new innovative ways of, of sensing, definitely. So that's sort of the area which is, um, yeah, which is quite quite interesting, quite hot. Um, we will have the talk two weeks from now about ubiquitous computing and uh, Internet of Things, and there might be some interesting discussions there about sensing as well, because you can have um, uh, you can have certain sensors being placed. Um, 
on different parts of your body, which then communicate with the phone and allow you to even get even more insights. Um, yeah, I know there was a, a project which is using some uh, air filters and checks certain particles, so senses certain chemicals in, in the air to discover of, of what you are doing and where you are. So it could discover that you're in a toilet, for example, or it could discover that you're eating a meal um, because of the composition of those different chemicals around you in, in the air. Uh, so it could kind of give extra context to the activities you're doing. Um, yeah, there was an interesting project where you placed uh, you the, the microphone, uh, the, the headphones which you place around your ear, but you can also have a headphone around your ear together with the microphone, which was pointing to your jaw, and then by listening to the way you eat, to the way you chew, it was detecting what sort of meal you're having, what you eat, uh, whether it's a fruit or whether it's a meat, or you know, and kind of trying to work out the calories, how much you've eaten in, in terms of calories by analyzing the sounds of you chewing. <laughs> so there are some kind of new innovative ways of, of sensing stuff, uh, which yeah may surprise us, you know. All right, any other ideas or comments? So I'm, I'm quite interested in, uh, in sensing myself. Uh, I, quite, I find it quite fascinating uh, how much it impacts our privacy. So how much, for example, the phones know about us, uh, and how much it, it, in the future we will give away. So it, you know, the concept of privacy is kind of dissolving slowly. We will, you know, we had those uh, Orwellian kind of uh, stories about the the, um, the state kind of big brothering everybody and controlling everything and so on. And it's kind of, it happens from the back door. It's like we're doing it for ourselves, right? You know, it's not the state which monitors us. We kind of monitor ourselves. We, uh, you know, put Fitbits on ourselves and, and try to record more about ourselves to learn more. Um, and it's, yeah, it's kind of, it can have very interesting implications. Uh, and it's the same with Google Glass and some other augmented reality sensory things. The moment we start wearing things which record video continuously uh, and possibly stream it continuously as well, then you know, the whole privacy thing goes to hell uh, because we have like a video surveillance 24-7 everywhere. Uh, you know. your, uh, the alteration for the Xbox Specs, the new one. Okay. It's supposed to be on for them. Yeah. So they don't like to have a camera with it. Seriously. Yeah. Especially now up here on the top, it's in my person, whatever. Yeah. Uh, it's exactly, yeah. And it's in fact also. I was reading the, the article about the uh, Linux being approached by NSA to try to put some, to sneak in some backdoors into Linux kernel. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, obviously that wouldn't fly, even if he agreed to that, because it's an open source project, so everybody can bet what's happening. Uh, but the interesting implication is whether the Mac or Windows, for example, kernels have backdoors for NSA to tap into your computers and see what. I think Microsoft has confirmed that they have that they're working uh, together with the so I think Skype, for example, has. Uh, yeah, Skype had. Yeah, Skype was clear. Skype clearly had uh, backdoors uh, because somebody kind of. Find it out and backdoor itself. Um, yeah. There was supposed to like list the words that find Jack to work on the system as And it contains numbers like the Maya and the Wiggle Alberts. Someone posted that the entire list to me on the spot. And triggered a lot of alarms. <laughs> Was a lot of all the flow. <laughs> I think they have a lot of that uh, when they first came across to that list. So, uh, what do you think about Snowden? Was he a hero or was he a traitor? That's the kind of old fashioned you know, uh, 
question. Well, you could say, well, the government tries to keep as much stuff secret from us as they can. It's not uh, so obvious, so I don't quite understand uh, why she did everything that she did after mm -hmm. the initial leak. Uh, but overall, I think she did the right thing. Yeah. Well, before that, uh, speaking about uh, government uh, tracking everyone uh, was like kind of well had. Conspiracy theory. Yeah, conspiracy kind of theory. Yeah. theory. And uh, now it's not. <laughs> so it, it leads to thinking whether the current the conspiracy theories and foil heads, uh, maybe they're right as well. Mm -hmm. And at some point, it will be revealed as well. So, and we can actually. It's kind of interesting, though, as well. It's like they claim that we have proof that you are doing this, and the higher ups, you know, generals, and whatever, say, no, 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 we're not doing that. Then they release the proof, okay, I'll turn it off the wall. Could you not do that? Yes, you want to the new proof comes up. Well, you are doing that. I can't hear about that. Can I go that uh, around in a circle? That is true. And that's very annoying. So you can't really trust the releases. Like, they will always lie first time they, if they can. Um, of course, because people that want to know that they're going to the open and they send such messages. And, I mean, if it is Gmail and uh, mail clients or whatever, mail provider, uh, everything is scanned. Yeah. I mean, everything is scanned. It is. Like, there's no game around it. No, 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 but at least everybody knows it is scanned, right? Well, it, it is kind of obvious. Because people, people are ignorant, really. Yeah, but that's their fault. Like, uh, for those who are not uh, ignorant, mm -hmm. it's obvious that that's in public, right? You wouldn't be transmitting something over the which you don't want. If you, if you want to keep private. There was like, uh, what's the name of the mail provider that was just there to launch it? Well, of it. Yeah, they were like uh, having everything encrypted and the potential launch of the NSA. They were pushing them to release uh, emails for like a bunch of their users. Mm -hmm. And they did shut down their internet parts every time. Oh, and really? They also forced. Uh, this company to provide uh, what it does. Yeah, and their CEO, uh, he gave them the certificate printed uh, with four, uh, four the size of four on the landing pages. <laughs> it was kind of a joke. <laughs> <laughs> it's a four. <laughs> and then he had to scale out the proper certificates in uh, yeah. electronic form, but the initial one kind of fast. The problem about that thing is that uh, he's uh, under like a gag order, so he can't talk about any of the cookie dust he was supposed to use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, that's kind of sad because it means you know, he did all this consulting work for someone, but he was, so it makes you wonder about how many of these cookies are there. They don't want to talk about it for 25 million dollars or see for 20 million dollars and mm -hmm. listen for the next 25 years. Yeah. Uh, there's probably a lot of these cases out there. Yeah, definitely. And it's not that obvious because they can't publicly yeah, discuss it. There was one there was one other guy who was talking about it from he brought this lawyer to not be to because the the lawyer had to stop him for some time. All right, so thank you. Thank you very much for the discussion today. Uh, we will um, meet next.